This conference was truly a collaborative effort. Um, so I'd first like to thank John Bio, Pedro Mira Monteiro, Antonio Sergio Guimarães, and Lili Schwartz, the coordinators of um, HACA, all of the co-sponsors, and especially all of you for being here. To take the city as a key nexus in disease health processes, as well as in race and citizenship, shouldn't require too much elaboration. In a rapidly urbanizing world, Brazil, the United States, and other countries of the Americas are among the most urban. In census categories that we shouldn't necessarily, of course, take for granted, um, over 80% of the populations of both Brazil and the United States um, are urban. Urbanized societies, in the case of Latin America, are the result of relatively recent and rapid uh, developments. Until the 1950s, only about a third of Brazil's population lived um, in cities. And in several cases now, for the first time, most urban dwellers um, uh, haven't arrived in cities from elsewhere. There seem to be analogies between 20th century developments in medical fields and modern city planning. Specialization in one, separation of functions in the other. In the case of urban life, health becomes a metonymy for broader processes. The cities of modernists, as we know, sought to segregate the spaces of work, mobility, and leisure, as well as the spaces of cure, care, and disease. There is a tradition from the Renaissance to the Chicago School of thinking about cities as organisms. In the 19th century, when city planning was intricately, intricately tied to hygienism, Disease prevention helped to shape many of our contemporary cities, or the geographies of many of our contemporary cities. Uh, miasma theories about uh, disease transmission often led to the demolition of hills to improve air circulation. Medical metaphors were frequently used to diagnose certain populations as undesirable, often with racial over and under tones. In the late 1920s, Alfred Agache, a positive-influenced uh, planner who co-founded the French Society of Urbanists in uh, 1912, someone we'll hear about soon, uh, at least in two of the other talks uh, today, um, arrived in Brazil. And his ideas would profoundly impact cities like Recife, Porto Alegre, Curitiba, and New Jersey. Agashi was at the time one of Europe's most prestigious urbanists in a generation that eagerly sought to use the cities of colonial Africa and Latin America as laboratories for urban experimentation. So we now return to one of the themes from yesterday already. Agashi writes that he wishes to be seen as a type of doctor. He describes, or he prescribes, the total destruction of Rio de Janeiro's favelas, which he deemed a leprosy. He claims they were inhabited by, quote, a sort of nomad population, averse to any and all rules of hygiene. The not so obvious, there are many obvious implications, but perhaps not so obvious implication is that since most of this, these uh, mixed race and black population was, quote unquote, nomadically inclined, forced relocation should not cause unease even among enlightened reformers. Throughout the 20th century, uh, discourses of urbanism and beyond uh, uh, privileged the idea of the city as a human body. Proposed concrete highways cutting across neighborhoods and homes promised to contain all the palpitation and life of the metropolis, to quote from a newspaper of the 1940s in Rio de Janeiro, but it really could have been in many other cities. References to modern wide streets as arteries abound. Slums and poor neighborhoods become cancers to be extirpated. In many cases, organic images conceal the most dehumanizing processes. The new arteries were meant not for all people, not for the flow of all people, but rather of the machines, military units, automobiles of a powerful few. Um, perhaps as still today, uh, medical, cutting edge medical um, advances disproportionately reach certain social and racial groups. Cities, of course, suggest a wonderful array of metaphors, but they can just as easily resist or elude them. 
even the most plastic metaphor succumbs to the multifaceted dimensions of cities as lived and imagined spaces. In the city's organism, what is the lifeblood? People, cars, capital, dreams? Who diagnoses ailments and administers a cure? About a year ago, after we had started uh, the plans to bring together many of you people to discuss this nexus of, of health and city, I attended a workshop with scholars and activists using the latest digital technologies to improve city life. I was struck by the persistence of medical metaphors, and as a cultural historian, um, troubled by precedents and their racial implications, all of which didn't register which, with the young um, tech crowd. But in retrospect, I think that there might have been something important and promising in their um, lack of responsibility and sort of ahistorical ambition to care for our cities as a whole often, I should add, including the environment to dimensions of health. There was a recognition that the hyper-specialization of planning and perhaps medical practices cannot meet the scale of our current challenges, that a healthy city, and we'll discuss what this might mean, demands more inclusive and meaningful belongings, where we handle differences with greater care and imagination, where we recognize, cultivate, and exercise rights to cities, citizenship, and health. So with that, vamos que vamos. Let's uh, <laughs> pass the word along to you. I'm not a historian, so there are lots of people here in the room that I even cite in my talk that know much more about me. but. I work with public health, mostly malaria, and I think history is absolutely crucial to be able to do my work so I can understand what I see now based on what happened in the past. So we do a very lousy job in public health from looking at history, but I, I try to look at it in, in my work. So before I jump into Brazil, I just want to give you two examples of the different dimensions that the discussion between health and race could really have in the past. And, and I'm sorry, both of the examples are drawn from the malaria literature. It's totally biased towards that. But um, So the first one is um, a, a sort of a thought uh, that happened during the colonial times in the Americas, basically saying that the blacks were sort of inferior race because they didn't even get malaria. So all the issues about immunity and all of that were not into discussion. And the second one, a slightly different perspective, much more recent. So this is in the late 50s, early 60s when the malaria eradication campaign um, of that time failed, um, that um, some, somebody from USA basically said, well, maybe it didn't fail. Maybe it was a good thing, because then you don't have all those people from the developing world reproducing at very high fertility rates. So those two examples give you an idea, just a sample of how this discussion between health and race really took place in the past. So what I'm going to do now is walk you through a few facts and events that happened um, in the past um, in Brazil. <coughs> and I'll start with the colonial times after the royal family came to Brazil and then the early uh, republic time. So um, starting from the colonial times, I'm really going to talk about Rio here. That was the capital uh, at the time. That's where the royal family was. That's where the central administration was located. And when we talk about Rio, we have to talk about something that it's a little bit understudied in the literature, which is urban slavery. We talk a lot about slavery in the rural side, but not so much in the city. And it was very present in Rio. So if you take the period between 1808, when the royal family came in 1850, Rio re really had the largest slave population in the Americas. Um, and after 1850, the population started to decline because of several diseases, TB, yellow fever, and several epidemics of cholera. Now, there are three things that I want to highlight here, and, and the list could be long, but I'll talk about those three. The first one is slaves were not allowed to use shoes. Shoes were a symbol of freedom. So just to name one disease that was quite common was tetanus, because they're doing all their jobs barefoot. And those jobs include, for example, carrying people when the streets were flooded. Okay? Um, they used to live and sometimes work in locations that were known in Rio for fevers. And fevers here are not just malaria, other diseases as well. 
Um, and when they were really sick, that their owners thought they were gonna die, they were basically left naked on the streets to die. And it was very expensive to do a burial. So the police would wait until there were many of them to do a mass burial. So you can start to imagine the health conditions that Rio really had at that time. On top of that, there was no drainage system, no sewage system in the city. So everything was on the streets. And one of the jobs that the slaves in the city had were to carry all those waste matter and dump it directly into the ocean. And here, there are two illustrations. The one on the left are slaves working for the royal family, and they're carrying all the waste matter in the barrels to dump into the ocean. And the second one was a routine job done daily, usually at night after 10 p.m., when the slaves are carrying those baskets with all the waste materials, basically feces, urine, and rats of dead animals that were on the street and dumping them into the ocean, okay? Another thing that is really crucial to mention here um, is that between 1850s and 1860s, there was this proliferation of a type of housing in the city called ortizos. And here there are two photos to sort of exemplify what they really were. Um, there was a massive migration to Brazil in the 40s because of the boom of coffee. So people living in those areas, and, and as you can see, there were several rooms. Um, the population density in those areas was really high, really packed, um, and the cleaning conditions not necessarily were the best. But you have here people living that could not afford other housing, and sometimes people that didn't have jobs. They were migrants, and they were the freed slaves, okay? Now, it is in the, this context that there is an idea that is revisited by some of the politicians in Brazil. So there was this concept of dangerous class that was proposed by an English writer, uh, Mary Carpenter, in 1840. And, and she proposed this concept in a very specific context of crime. So there was a very clear definition of what she was calling dangerous class. And the politicians sort of revised, revisited, and adapted in a totally distorted way. And what the idea at the time is a good citizen in the city is somebody that works hard, likes to work, is able to save, and uses those savings to have a nice life. If somebody cannot make savings, therefore is a poor person, probably that's an indication that person doesn't like to work or doesn't work hard. So you have this shift basically linking the poor to being a dangerous class. And the blacks became immediately the most common sus suspects of being dangerous in the city. Um, so if we start having this issue that was raised yesterday by Lilia that it's, it's race as color, but it's also the social status that starts to be uh, blended. Now, um, the other thing that the government then did was to look at this dangerous class and sort of blame them for the epidemics, for the diseases. So they basically were claiming that the living conditions of the, this population, basically of the poor, um, was the reason why there were so many diseases um, in the city. And the focus of public health at that time becomes cleaning the houses of the poor, of the dangerous class. So it becomes the total focus on hygiene. And by doing this, there is a total neglect of looking at specific diseases, of looking at nutrition, and of looking at, for example, the horrible working conditions that those people were exposed to. Bad working conditions, long hours, and so on. Now, um, I wanna give you a very clear example of the implications of that. And it's an example where a priority was set in public health based on racial ideals. So if you take the period that goes between 1850 and 1920, there were so many diseases in Rio that at some point there were quarantine uh, uh, routines that had to be made, uh, disinfection of ships <coughs> because some of the ships coming from Europe were afraid to stop at the port in Rio because of the disease. So if you take only two examples, tuberculosis and yellow fever, so tuberculosis was by far the main cause of death in Rio. However, tuberculosis was not, let's say, selective. So it was killing whites, blacks, locals, foreigners, 
And at the time it was claimed, even Paris have it. So if Paris has TB, you can blame Rio for having TB. On the other hand, yellow fever was killing most the migrants, the Europeans. And they wanted the Europeans to come because at that time there's this idea that the whitening of the population will promote growth and development for the country. So yellow fever was seen as a barrier for bringing more migrants, bringing more whites into the country. So the decision to focus on yellow fever basically totally neglects looking at diseases that were impacting the black population. And in some way, you are indirectly trying to put aside all the influence of the African country in the Brazilian society. Um, so basically, the control focus on yellow fever, and it focused on those houses of where the dangerous population were living, basically the cortisos. Connected to that, I want to mention um, a quote from a report that was written by a US, US secretary living in Brazil. This is a 1903 report. And basically what he says is that smallpox and TB killed large numbers of colored people. We talked about names yesterday. That's the expression that is used. Uh, playing an important role to the whitening of the population, which would contribute to make the giant of South America, Brazil, a viable investment. So this idea was not only Brazil, uh, it was coming from other places as well. So it is in this context of focusing on the dangerous class that we shift to the republic that uh, was declared in 1889, and uh, there are a few events that I want to highlight here. Um, the first one is all this destruction, the demolition of the Cortisus. Um, there was one that was all over the news. So it was in 1893, it was one very famous Cortiso in Rio called Cabeça de Porco or Pig's Head. And that's the cover of a um, widely distributed magazine at the time that has a pig's head and a huge cockroach on top which sort of connects these bad living conditions to those um, housing units. Now, other cortisos were being demolished. And then in 1903, when um, a new mayor takes term, uh, Pereira Passos, there is this major urban reform that is completely founded on soil theory, miasma um, hygiene, as Bruno said in the beginning. So it's all these ideals that are focusing or framing the urban reform. So the poor housing, the cortisos is all being demolished. And you have um, large avenues being built, new buildings, plazas. And this is just a sample. This is 1904. This is 1905. Everything is being demolished. Every be everything is being built. That was what was happening during that time of the urban reform. But the question that can be raised is, well, where was those people being moved to? Where is the dangerous, the poor, being relocated? Well, they were going here. That's a mountain in the city at the time. It was called Morro da Favela. And there were just a few supposed to be temporary houses there um, being inhabited by soldiers coming from a war that happened in Bahia in the northeast of Brazil and by freed slaves. The folks living in Cortiços, after the Cortiços were demolished, they could take the wood and they used the wood to build more houses in here, which again were supposed to be temporary. The irony in this story is that the urban reform, which was framed based on all this health ideals, miasma and soil and so on, marked the beginning of the favelas in Rio. In this one place, you can see how it evolved in 1920, 1977, and now. Now it's called Morro da Previdência, and it's one of the favelas, one of the slums in Rio. So, this whole initiative of making the city look like Paris, like the Belle Epoque, created all the favelas that we have to this day. It's in this context of looking at the poor as dangerous, moving them in, in a forced way, that we have another big event uh, in, in public health um, in Brazil, which is the revolt of the vaccine. So in 1904, there was uh, the smallpox vaccine became mandatory and force could be used to vaccinate people. Now, this was imposed without any kind of information about why the vaccine is good, so people didn't really perceive the benefits of the vaccine. In fact, the perception was that the vaccine could be a strategy, another strategy to get rid of the poor, 
So there was popular protests. Uh, this is just one of the train that was uh, turned. Uh, some were uh, set on fire. Um, and here I quote Nico Pau, who's right here, that in fact the, the revolt wasn't against the vaccine, but it was against the entire context that was put together at the time based on historical <coughs> facts that happened before. Uh, and here I show only two cartoons. There were many at the time, um, and I, I particularly love them, but the first one on top uh, basically tries to portray the vaccine as something that is a torture to yourself. And the second one is the war. So you have the, the army of the physicians and nurses uh, with only one gun, which is gonna be the, the, the vaccine, and the, the population with anything they can get hands on fighting against them. Um, now, the other thing, the last thing I want to mention is a, a completely shift in this thinking of um, looking at the poor as the dangerous population, so making a disconnection that we had until then. So in 1960, uh, 1916, um, there is a sanitation movement that starts in Brazil. And it was really inspired by phenomenal expeditions that were made by Osvaldo Cruz and Carlos Chagas and others to the Amazon and to the northeast of Brazil. And what those reports were saying was that that population is completely isolated, completely neglected of actions from the government, and they're basically sick. And this is some of the diseases that they reported um, in those reports. So in 1916, in a speech uh, in the medical school in Rio, uh, Miguel Pereira basically said, well, the problem of Brazil is not race, is not climate. The problem of Brazil are the diseases. And Brazil is an enormous hospital. So this, this statement he made became quite famous. And some of the people considered this the starting point of the sanitation uh, movement in Brazil. Now, yesterday we mentioned literature. And I also bring the literature here. Um, and I want to mention two. The first one, Euclides da Cunha. Um, so I mentioned one book, with Sertões, which was translated as Rebellion in the Backlands, that became the reference book for the sanitation movement, when he basically portrays those people living in the interior areas as completely isolated, completely forgotten, sort of the invisible population, without any resources, without any care. And the second one that I want to mention is Monteiro Lobato. And the reason I'm going to mention him is because he changed opinion over time. So in 1914, before the sanitation movement, he created this character that was sort of the stereotype of underdevelopment in Brazil. So he called him Jaca Tatu, and he was basically the dangerous class. He was lazy, he didn't like to work, he had no savings, he was poor, he didn't care at all about the country. Independence, abolition, he doesn't care. Um, and there were several jokes at the time being made. So if, if you, you could call a poor person, oh, you are a jacket tattoo, okay? Now, this was 1914. The sanitation movement comes, and then something ring, like a bell ring in his head, and four years later, he comes with a new character, now called Jeca Tatuzinho. And you can see, so that was him before, so he has like the cachaça, the drink, and it's not working. Um, he's just holding his dog. Look at him now. So he cured all his diseases. He became the symbol of the sanitation movement. Um, he prospered. He has a nice farm. He has animals. And what I really think is interesting is that he's fat now. But that's a, another side story. And smoking, right? And smoking, right. So, so he's doing everything wrong. But now he's, you know, he's the symbol of the sanitation campaign. And he really embraces those ideas that Forget about race, forget about climate. The key issue that is stopping Brazil from developing are the diseases. Now, an important thing is all, all this discussion had a very heavy environmental component. So it's not about treating people, but it's about changing the environment where they live. And on the left, you have the house of Jeca before the sanitation. And there are three words in there. It's dirty, you have diseases, and he's poor. Then you shift to the right, that's his house after the sanitation. And now the three words are health, comfort, and prosperity. Okay? 
All right. So um, I hope that I gave you a flavor of some of the historical events that really helps us to understand some of the inequalities and some of the problems that persist in the city. The way the cities are growing, and here we're talking about real, not necessarily fix those problems. They actually augment some of those problems. Um, and I sort of shifting forward in time, I can give you two examples that are happening now that sort of show this inequality that, that we can see looking at socioeconomic status. So uh, if we consider one of the major disease problems in Brazil now, it's uh, non-communicable diseases. So if you take all the mortality in Brazil, about 70% are due to NCDs. But when you look at the distribution by socioeconomic status, uh, both morbidity and mortality are much higher among the poor. The second one, which I think is a ticking bomb in Brazil, is the issue of overweight and obesity. So currently you have about half of the adult population overweight and about 10, how much is it? And about 12% obese. Um, and that's the adults. When you look at 10 to 19, it's about 20 overweight and 5% obese. That's huge. And this happens in every single socioeconomic strata, but when you look at the percentage increase over time, it's increasing much more among the low-income families. Now, I want to finish uh, quoting something that Keith said yesterday. So he said, the city is a place where the pursuit of good health was always, has always been imagined. And if you read some of the recent reports from UFPA and from the UN, this thought is very much in there. So I guess the question is, why is this not realized if all the opportunities for good health are there in the city or should be there in the city? And, and I think it goes back to the title of this conference. It has to do with the rights, with the differences, and with the belongings. Thank you. And it's really a great opportunity to come to Princeton. That's my first time here. And to meet uh, so many colleagues and I mean, new, new people. And also to meet João. Uh, well, the last time I met João was 15 years ago in Boston. So that's kind of a, it's, a, it's very good, very nice to meet him again. And Ad Adriana, probably I'm going to see her tomorrow. And uh, I would like to start by saying that when I arrived at Princeton two days ago, and I got the folder for the conference, I find myself at a needs, in a way. Because uh, I was a, really a, a little bit conf um, concerned, and I even mentioned that to, to Lily and, and, and João, because that's my paper, this kind of complex name there, pharmacogenomics, human genetic diversity, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, my God. So I felt myself in the subtitles, actually, not really the, in the main title of the conference. <laughs> So, uh, but it was really, I mean, yesterday uh, we were discussing about uh, João, Lili, uh, Keith, Weilu, and Arcadio were talking about difference, <coughs> sameness, and power, about belonging, right, and justice, uh, about naming, uh, visibility, inclusion, invisibility, exclusion, role of public intellectuals, and I mean, that's what I'm going to be talking about, actually. Th these are my topics, in a way. And uh, it was very nice that, uh, I mean, that wonderful overview that Marcia presented because I sort of start where she stopped, in a way. So I'm going to be talking about this, these issues, uh, looking in 21st century, looking about DNA, looking about genomics, and talking, in, but talking about actually uh, Brazil as a racial laboratory. So that's <laughs> a very old topic. That's uh, how, how this is uh, playing in the age of uh, genomics. So this, this, this work is part of an ongoing uh, project that I'm carrying out with uh, several other people on, um, gen I mean, on population human, uh, human population genetics, um, human biological diversity in the post-Second world, world War period in Brazil. I mean, there is a lot on race, on eugenics in, in, in Brazil and everywhere, actually before the Second World War. And there is a the group of scholars that's becoming very much interested in what happened after the Second World War, where thought of uh, genetics, in a way, helped to defeat race. But at the same time, race is coming back in a very strong way in current genomic science. That's what I'm going to be 
I want to talk I want to uh, talk to you about. So this paper uh, it's co-authored by Glaucia Silva from the uh, Depart Department of Anthropology, Federal uh, Fluminense Federal University in Rio, and uh, it's a cooperation also with Sarah Gibbon from the Anthropology Department, University College in London. Having said that, this is my main subject here, just molecule in a way. So warfarin, that's this molecule is the most widely prescribed <coughs> anticoagulant drug in the world. It's normally used in the prevention of thrombosis and thromboembolism, that is, the formation of blood clots in the blood vessels. It was uh, initially introduced in the late 1940s as a pesticide against rats and mice. And in the early 1950s, warfarin was found to be effective and relatively safe as a, an anticoagulant for human use. As warfarin activity is determined partially by genetic factors, there has been a lot of interest in understanding its pharmacogenomics. Genotypes of uh, two genes have been included as covariates in several algorithms developed for the decimation of the individual warfarin dosing requirement. I mean, how doctors, how they define the dose of warfarin. So there are some very complex algorithms that include several variables to define uh, these, these doses. Uh, so the frequency distribution of polymorphies related to warfarin uh, is, uh, in, this, in these two genes varies across populations. So warfarin is so widely used that medical doctors anywhere in the world, through their cell phones, tablets, and personal computer, they can access online an online program to calculate doses of warfarin in clinical situations. You can do that right now if you are. <laughs> if you want. If, if you are bleeding, you can use that right now. <laughs> and perhaps the most popular, uh, popular website is this one, Warfarin Dosing, which is, I quote, a free website to help doctors and other clinicians begin warfarin therapy by estimating the therapeutic dose in patients new to warfarin, end of, end of quote. As February 19, I mean the, the day before yesterday, this site had had, had, had more than 570 thousand visits. So probably by the end of this year, it's going to be one million visits this site has had. So after clicking the option buy for indosing, uh, one gets to the page required patient information, which is on the upper left side. I mean, there are too much information there, but you, can, you have to trust me a little bit here. So, uh, and the, the menu requests information about patient's age, sex, stature, and clinical history. There are specific entries for genetic information there on the lower left side, but when one can choose not to fill this sort of information. And I mean, this, this, uh, this genetic tests are, really, uh, are not really readily available in many clinical contexts, so you can, you can go through that without the genetic information. But there are particularly, uh, we are particularly interested here in two specific questions. The one about ethnicity there, which you have to fill, who is non-Hispanic, Hispanic, and unknown, and the other one about race. This has to be filled when you estimate the buffer in dose. So in recent decades, the ability to examine human genetic variation with greater specificity and detail has challenged entrenched ideas uh, about biological racial differences between humans. The unexpected revival of discussion in interest around race in the context of genomic research has been highlighted by several authors. In the recent collection in, uh, edited by Koenig et al. Uh, entitled Revisiting Race in a Genomic Age, it is noted that, I quote, contrary to expectations and hopes, post-genomic science has revived the idea of racial categories as proxies for biological differences, end of quote. Kis Lu, in a recent edited volume called Genetics and the Unsettled Past, the Collision of DNA, Race, and History, he wrote, I quote, our genetic markers have come to be regarded as portals to the past. Analysis of these markers is increasingly used to investigate and judge issues of social membership and kinship, to rewrite history and collective memory, and to open new thinking about health and well-being." End of quote. Pharmacogenomics occupies a very central role in the debates about how contemporary biological and medical science is reviving the idea of racial categories as proxies for biological differences. So anthropologists, sociologists, and SDS scholars uh, have recently written about what they call 
molecular reinscription of race in pharmacogenomic research to use an expression by Duana Fu Wiley inspired in Jerome Rose's idea of molecularization in the book The Politics of Life Itself. She, as well as all, uh, several other doctors like, uh, authors like Catherine Bliss, Jonathan Kahn, Sandra Lee, and Michael Montoya, just to mention a few, have argued that public funding for research on the action of drugs in countries like the US requires that the racial classification of research subjects should be considered when defining the composition of the samples as well as in data analysis. In a controversial arena, once race is included in research design, it has created the possibility of interpreting that whites and blacks are so distinct that pharmacogenes present in the genetic background of black people would be absent from the genetic background of white and vice versa. Finally, she carried out research in two US pharmacogenomic labs and, and she detailed, and I quote, how a team of scientists invested in understanding pharmacogenetic difference in US racial groups maintains idea of racial homogeneity and intergroup distinction with regard to genetic variation. Through practice of recruiting, organizing, storing, and comparing human DNA by US racial categories. U.S. racial distinct, uh, distinction is conserved in the laboratory, with little open discussion about the possible bias it brings to thinking about genetic results and their significance." End of quote. So much of the anthropological, sociological, and STS research on the issue of race and pharmacogenomics have been carried out in, in Europe and, and North America, which of course have their own historic, geographic, and cultural and political particularities. One could ask, are other and specific in interfaces of race, racial identities, and contemporary genetic science as they relate to pharmacogenomics when we direct our gaze to other parts of the world? In order to address this issue, this paper is, a, is an anthropological investigation carried out at the Brazilian uh, National Cancer Institute, Inca. The focus is on the research conducted by a leading Brazilian pharmacologist Guilherme Suarez Kurtz on the pharmacogenomics of warfarin. As we will see, the criticism of Brazilian scientists to current pharmacogenomic research include a revision of warfarin dosing algorithms, including the race components, widely used in clinical procedures around the world, as we have seen. Thus, paraphrasing full widely, our paper poses the following question. Through practice of recruiting, organizing, storing, and comparing human DNA by Brazilian categories, are Brazilian social cultural perspectives on race relation being conserved in the molecular, uh, in the molecular biology labs? So a bit of history here uh, on human genetics. Uh, human population genetics became established in Brazil in the 1950s as part of a very complex global network of a scientific exchange. Leading, genet leading US geneticists, including Theodosio Dobzhansky, which is in the upper uh, left side there, uh, James Neal and Newton Morton, with support of Rockefeller Foundation and, the agent and other agencies, including the Atomic Bomb Energy Commission, played key roles in the development of genetics in Brazil in the post-World War II period. Initial human genetic in Brazil focused on what they call the classical genetic markers, the ABO, Diego factor, serum protein, this sort of uh, material aimed at understanding the formation and the evolution of the composition of the Brazilian population. This body of research came to be known as racial mixture studies, and aimed in particular to establish the relative contribution, and I quote here, of white, Caucasian, black, Negroid, and Indian population to the gene pool of the Brazilian uh, people. Key authors as Salzano, uh, author of that book there from 1967, and uh, Newton Freire Maia highlighted the importance of the genetic diversity of the Brazilian population for the understanding of admixture and interacting relations on a global scale. And I just added this morning, the picture is not very good, but there is that 1973 book called Brazil Laboratório Racial by uh, Newton Freire Maia, which is very interesting considering what we have been discussing since, I mean, since yesterday. I mean, the idea of uh, uh, Brazil as a, labor as a laboratory, also in the, in the genetic perspective more recently. So, uh, so quick, currently, 
Uh, Sergio Pena from the Federal uh, University of Minas Gerais is one of the leading Brazilian human geneticists. And I'm listing here some of uh, some major references I'll be talking about here. I don't have to memorize them, I don't have to copy them, <laughs> just to, to I can follow my, my, my reason here. On one hand, a Pena publication in the early 2000s, exemplified by the two references above, reveal a discursive continuity with racial mixture studies. In particular, in its emphasis on the high degree of miscegenation of the Brazilian population. This might be exemplified by his findings of a vast majority of Y chromosome uh, of European origin Brazilian population at the same time that approximately one third of the mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, talking about uh, patrilineages, matrilineages here, uh, are from European, American, and African uh, origins. In 2003, Pena uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science this, this third paper there called Color and Genomic Ancestry in Brazil. In this study, which was based on the analysis of morphological traits and on a battery of so-called ancestry informative markers, which are genetic markers from, uh, to indicate ancestry origins from the nuclear DNA, they, they concluded, I quote, our data suggests that in Brazil, at an individual level, color, as determined by physical evaluation, is a poor predictor of African ancestry estimated by molecular markers." End of quote. We would need much more time to address the many repercussions of this, that these studies have had, not only within the scientific community, but also in Brazilian society at large. On one hand, Pena, Pena's writings about the history and present situation of racial relations in Brazil, including recent publications like this PLOS, uh, this one here on the bottom, uh, which also focuses on the mixture, have been greatly disputed by some social movements. On the other hand, it has received a great deal of attention by the scientific community and influenced pharmacogenomic research. So Suarez so Kurtz. Uh, was a faculty at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro from the 1960s to the 1990s, when he carried out research in the fields of physiology and pharmacology. From the start of his career, he traveled extensively abroad for his study and research, and he would continue the research that he developed at institutions in France, England, and the US when he returned to Brazil, sometimes adapting it to local conditions. In the 1970s and 1980s, he continued in Brazil the, the studies on muscular physiology using crayfish as the experimental model that he was developing that research in New York, actually. But he had to adapt that model, uh, and he was using a small blue crab endemic to the Brazilian sea coast because it was sort of very difficult to import to Brazil those crayfish back then. And studies on frogs that he developed in Europe, funded by, uh, actually in the US, funded by the American Association of Muscular Dystrophy, were continued in Brazil by Suarez Kurtz using mice and opossums. In his search to unite creativity expressed by designing novel experiments with continuity by readapting the experiments begun abroad to local conditions, Suarez Kurtz developed an approach that incorporated autochthonous sub-objects su and subjects as essential elements in universal models. So in the early 2000s, when Suarez Kurtz began research in pharmacogenetics at the National Cancer Institute in Rio de Janeiro, he used this creative adaptive approach in new circumstances. He made the Brazilian population the object of his research in pharmacogenomics. But Suarez Kurtz chose not its distinctive character as a variation of a general paradigm, but rather to question the viability of a model accepted by pharmacogenetics as universal. I'm going to explain, explain that a little bit further on. It was the perception of the uniqueness of, of the autochthonous subjects, I mean the, the Brazilian population, uh, as something innovative and indispensable for the development of pharmacogenetics that led him to affirm that this was no longer a strategic choice for discussion, but a specific subject with global relevance. This approach, which characterized the research on pharmacogenomics of warfarin carried at Inca, reflects strategies that have long been embedded in genetic research in Brazil, as we have already discussed. 
with their focus on both aligning with transnational research agendas and establishing Brazil as uniquely different and important context for research, for study. I'm, So one of the main papers published by Suarez Kurtz in his team on pharmacogenomics in recent years focuses on warfarin dosing. That reference is there. I mean, the scientists developed a dosing algorithm that included genetic and non-genetic factors like age, weight, therapeutic indication, and co-treatment with two other drugs. They reported that the algorithm that they developed, which is kind of the, the idea of the algorithm, very similar to that first, the second slide that I showed you, explained 51% of the variance in the stable weekly warfarin dose in 390 patients they investigation, in, investigated in real. A major argument of the paper is that the algorithm's predictive, predictive power was similar across the self-identified race color subjects. That is, race color was not associated with stable warfarin dose in the multiple regressions. Based on these results, and in several other papers, Suarez Kurtz has concluded that, so three major conclusions. First, extrapolation of pharmacogenomic data from relatively well-defined ethnic groups is clearly not applicable to the majority of the Brazilians. So he's referring to that first algorithm there that I mentioned to you. Second, the frequency distribution of polymorphism in pharmacogenes varies continuously among Brazilians and is not captured by race, color, self-identification. That's very much along Sergio Pena's perspective of the individual set of race and other groups. And third, the intrinsic heterogeneity of the Brazilian population must be acknowledged in the design and interpretation of pharmacogenomic studies in order to avoid spurious, spurious conclusions based on improper matching of the study cohorts. Okay, four more minutes and I finish. So, going beyond strictly scientific articles, Swati Schools has published opinion pieces directed at the general public. In these articles, he stressed how, in his interpretation, Pharmacogenomics and the di genetic diversity of the Brazilian population relate to public health policy. In 2009, he published an editorial in Caderno de Saúde Pública, Report of Public Health, one of the leading journals in, in public health in Latin America, which is affiliated with the institution, I mean, the Oswaldo Cruz Institution, uh, of the, that belongs to the Ministry of Health. This journal is one of the main Brazilian periodicals that carry academic papers referring to the National Public Health System, SUS. In Brazil, this system includes all areas of health from outpatient care to organ transplants with the intent of providing, according to the law, uh, complete, universal, and free care for the whole population of the country. In this, uh, in this, in this editorial, he, he wrote, I quote, the results of our research show that the heterogeneity of our population must be dealt with as a continuous variable, which cannot be adequately represented by arbitrary race scholars category. In pharmacogenomic informed context, this implies that each person must be treated as an individual rather than as an exemplar of a race, and that the notion of race target drugs it is unacceptable. End of quote. This is my last slide, my, my last slide. Uh, in a talk uh, Suarez Schultz gave at a seminar on pharmacogenomics held in Puerto Rico in 2010, one of the many given of his research at international forums in recent years, Suarez Kurtz reiterated the conclusion he, had, he has often repeated in his publication. But this time, he, he illustrated his remarks with a curious combination of text and image. So surprisingly, along with a quotation on Brazil by the French count Arthur Gobineau, so a leading opponent of miscegenation in the 19th century, he showed the painting, The Workman, with Operarius by Tarsila do Amaral. This work, by one of the most famous Brazilian modernist painters, depicts the theme of miscegenation from a positive perspective, industrialization, and social transformation in Brazil in the early decades of the 20th century. So there is some tie here of my paper with city, 
So this helps to establish my, con my connection here with Ta Through Tassila Damarao, which is very elegant, actually. So have this image as background. Let's move to the, conclu the, the, the concluding remarks. So on one hand, we would like to suggest that far from witnessing a molecularization of race, as Fu Wiley and other authors outline, the Brazilian research in pharmacogenomics analyzed in this paper seems to suggest that the investigation of the Brazilian pharmacologist tends to work toward the demolecularization of race. This is justified by the narrative that places miscegenation as the distinctive and central element in the biological formation of the Brazilian population. Yet, and this is a very important point, at the same time, it must be acknowledged that the effort of demolecularizing race by pharmacologists in Brazil passes through a process in which, using Sandra Lee's words, bodies and body materials are nonetheless racialized institutionally. Even though this relates in Brazil less to the development of niche markets for new pharmacogenomic targets than the context in which transnational research collaboration and publication takes place. And what I mean here is that he has to, he, they have to include race in a way in this research, otherwise they don't get it published. <laughs> this is one of the specificities, actually. Uh, in other words, uh, we can perceive in the work of Swadi Schultz and his collaborators, they use of a heuristic strategy where it's clear that even while there is a critique of the use of racial pathologies in genetic research, there is necessary use, value, and incorporation of categories and taxonomies that are somewhat race-like. We call this racialized to deracialize. Throughout this paper, we have tried to show that pharmacogenomics in Brazil must be understood as a scientific practice deeply embedded in the values and history of the society where it's produced. In this sense, there are significant differences, but also similarities, with arguments recently put forward by scholars who have analyzed the interface between ethno-racial categories and pharmacogenomics in the contemporary uh, in literature on anthropology and uh, anthropology of science. Uh, so, I stop here. Thank you. You, you may imagine that I have a very huge task here to make comments in these two presentations that are quite different <coughs> in their approach. And uh, I want to begin uh, putting in context my comments, who I am and from where I will make these comments. I am a medical doctor with a training in psychiatry and uh, I never actually practiced medicine. I am an epidemiologist. And that's why I will comment that multiple regression model that was there, and that will be my comment. I'm, I'm kidding. I am an epidemiologist <laughs> that actually in the past fell in love with social science and very deeply. And that's why I had very good professors. And uh, I don't know if you know Professor João Guilherme Bill. I studied with him in the 90s, many years ago, when he was a visiting professor in the Federal University of Bahia. He helped me a lot in my master's dissertation. And now we, we met again two years ago, I guess, two or three years ago. And, and I was now, I am now an epidemiologist uh, in medical school working in the preventive medicine department. And I work with urban violence. I work with homicides and urban violence. And I don't work directly with race or racial issues, but I cannot deny in my words the importance of race. Uh, Race and racism also is a very, very important component to help us understand the patterns of violence distribution in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. And uh, that's how my interest in racial issues uh, comes from the view of an epidemiologist who deal with urban violence and homicide in a country like Brazil, in a city like Sao Paulo. Uh, but I, I, I will finish this context, and I will start to 
do my homework. Okay, I have to make smart comments and questions about these two very different presentations, and I'll try to do this. Uh, so I, I want to thank also to Marcia and Ricardo because they both had very, very interesting and inspiring talks and bringing very different questions that cover the whole temporal spectrum from the past to the present and the future because Ricardo's issues put questions for us uh, to think the future and how care, medicine, and uh, research in this field, uh, what, what it is produ uh, producing. Um, in Marcia's talk, uh, uh, it was quite clear that race through history have, uh, have in the present, it still has, had and have a very special place as an operator in the health field. Race thought as categories that in Brazil are based mostly in the color, in the skin color. Like was said yesterday, color is language in Brazil. Color matters. Race thought of as a qualitative or a categorical variable to use an epidemiological terms. We talk about blacks, whites, pardos, that is a category for lots of things. That's a taxonomic perspective that in Brazil at least relates mainly in the appearance, the traits, the skin color. Uh, it had and still had, has a very clear hierarchical dimension or component, a clear idea about superiority and inferiority, characterizing also a social status or a social position. It was also presupposed the existence of biological differences between races. This operator race served both as a construct that helped science and political men to understand the different pattern of morbidity and mortalities, as the example of malaria and this idea that the black don't even got malaria because they are inferior, that I never heard about it, it's quite uh, amazing. And also to build concrete actions, practice, policies, sanitation with a very strong hygienic and eugenic component, which perpetuated the difference and inequalities. In Master's speech, we had a broad view of how racial issues were treated in the health field, especially how this concept was incorporated for the formulation of public policies. A broader question was in the air, which country we, Brazil, are and want to be? It was in course a project that she mentioned all this, she mentioned also, and yes, yesterday also, to build a nation, to build our nation. Side by side with the health and sanitation policies, we had a huge debate through race mixture and proposed for widening our nation. Uh, I remember also Lydia's talk about the, mir the miracle, of the miracle of yesterday, the whitening, the, the concrete whitening of, of a person. The contribution of health field the medicine were made through the adoption of theories of a clear racial component, such as the theory of the degenerescence developed by Morel, just an example, and the consequent sanitary and hygienic policies. The example of Rio de Janeiro is quite important in this way. She also, in her speech, also we could see that race represented and still represents many differences in the appearance and all that, not only the skin color, but other physical and social traits. That was mainly a phenotypical definition or recognition of race. There was a strong connection between race and social status with very important consequences to the way we think about races and inclusive policies in Brazil. Ricardo's speech deals with a very up-to-date topic that is genomics, more specifically pharmacogenomics, and the idea of a inscription of race or the revival of racialized approach. That means a new biological approach to race 
and the inclusion of this category in the delineation of health practices. Taking as, ex as an example barfarin dosage, but that in health pra practice as a whole. There are lots of very interesting points we could discuss here, but we don't have, I, would, I have time limitations. So I will select some of them. Ricardo's talk brought us to the present and the future. Today, in the genomics era, phenotypical race is, no, is opening space to a genotypic race, explicitly inscribed in DNA. It is possible to think that in Brazil, at least, as stated by the pharmacogeneticist, the race thought of bio biologically and the race thought of as a social construct that is highly anchored in the social status and in the skin color, the apparent traits, split apart, or more precisely, do not correspond anymore. I'd like to hear you more about these two different approach, the taxonomic, the categorical, and based mostly in apparent traits, and the biogenetic, that in the extreme, as in the Brazilian case, results in the denial of apparent traits as a main anchor to the fine race. Here, he kind of points out to the vulgar position of Brazilian pharmacogeneticists that defend the idea of race as a continuum, based on the evidence that self-reported race do not correspond to the genetic composition. In the US, the molecularization of race coexists with the taxonomic approach. In Brazil, the molecularization is anchored in the proposal of a new model to describe biological variability of human space based on the idea of a continuum and that each person must be treated as an individual rather than as an example of race. I'm quoting. So how to think about these two moments, phenotypical and genotypical race, as representing two different ways of working with race and its consequences for public policies in health, not only those related to medication dosage and delivery, but in a broad sense that it is proposed by our health system, public and universal health policy, that needs to deal with huge historical inequities having phenotypical race as an important determinant. Another topic I'd like to discuss is the idea of this individualized medicine and the individual singularity model that takes into account the inherent individual genetic ancestral variability. Extreme individual preventive measures, for example, may be taken supported on genetic profiles as it's been done to face mammarian cancer risk. I don't want to discuss this topic in a specific but actually work further on the idea proposed by Suarez Cus in your presentation that there exist two different models for work with genetic diversity in human species. The first one, the typological, the second one, the population model, and the third one, the individual singularity model. Based on this, we could think about the existence of three models to do with health issues that includes but go beyond races and medication. The clinic, the collective and the population, and this new one, individual singular. This took me back to the course of Foucault. That's why I studied with John Bilea. Oh, yeah. I don't know why. Name it, society must be defended in the face of the society. In the lecture of March, 17th March, Foucault talks about the birth of biopower, a new technology of power that takes life events in the population expression as an object. In this lecture, Foucault makes a distinction between disciplinary power and the biopower, the power that regulates life and its population effects. And in your talk, Ricardo, you bring this new era into perspective, the genomics era, the focus now is not the individual as a disciplinary body, nor the regular population of phenomena, but the genetic profile. It's a radical movement for a new object, <laughs> which brings new perspectives for health field. We had up to now two general models to think about health policies and care, the clinic and the collective of public health, one taxonomic, disciplinary to some extent, and the other centering the population, its expression, and as a main focus for action. Now we have this individual medicine, this individual singularity model, 
that takes into concern not the ill of person with clinical diagnosis, but the potential to illness that genetic profile express. So I'd like to hear about this. And there are many other aspects that could be support. One is the political economy of knowledge production and publication, and how Brazil is being put in this. The actual idea of a knowledge that part from the, the presupposed the existence of a racial purity and which knowledge it is. And this also how made me think about this other idea that is working in the Foucault, is that uh, the idea of power uh, makes, uh, marks in any sense the birth of the state racism and how to think about this. But I think I will stop here and want to, to hear you, you both about this issue. And thank you again for the invitation. I'd like to thank uh, all of you for this very, very warm reception for us. Even the snow is perfect, it's beautiful. <laughs> and everything is very nice. I'd like to thank also USP uh, in the name of Lilia, Zencardo, and Elena, the Tefaleshi Medical School and Public Health School uh, to make possible with Princeton this collaborative network that is so rich and, and good for us. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave for the questions because I didn't have any questions for you. So if he wants to address something, that's fine. Sure. I don't have to take any time. What would take um, um, two or more questions? Yeah. That's a good idea. Uh, I moderated, but I was so <laughs> provoked by you. Can I make a comment? What a comment. Because um, uh, what struck me more is that um, it seems that we are always fighting social scientists and, and uh, 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 physicians and uh, scientists, hard scientists on the topic of race. Uh, that's interesting because in the past, and the Marxist talk was very, in this aspect was very uh, um, clear about it. Uh, race was a kind of um, way of uh, making natural social oppression of blacks. Yeah. And um, even the, in a genocidal uh, perspective, that is the, the idea that uh, it's not disease or, 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 or hygiene or epidemiology, it's, it's, uh, it's race. It is, mm, mm, mm. And, and then in Ricardo's uh, speech, what you see is that uh, somehow uh, there's this tendency of making this struggle uh, against, for civil rights against oppression that takes race as a marker, as um, a scientific, uh, 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 a way of, of, uh, of dealing with um, scientific categories. So we are always you know, a paradox of uh, when you, uh, uh, the genetic is right, it's against civil rights movement. And when it's uh, wrong, uh, it's, uh, uh, it suppresses people. So in the end, uh, that's, that's the paradox. That's, uh, so it's a, a little open to four of you have this beautiful pet and I have this uh, focused questions. <coughs> and I say I love this panorama that you gave us and maybe you had no time to talk more about the other side of this panorama. Because for a long time we called this period that you bought the laws as <laughs> the old republic, the Republic of and now we know that this term was created by Getulio Vargas in the sense that to show that he was the, the president of a new era, a very modern era. And the other one was an, an old one. So, and when we give this kind of images that, that, that are real, we don't show the other side. Could you talk a little about the other side? Perhaps we had these interventions and all those things because the First Republic was a moment of a lot of fights 
So we had the Nusim revolt, but we had the, a lot of other revolts, a lot of other complaints. And even in those places like the <coughs> new favelas and so on, people were fighting and were trying to create new new formats for the city. And also Motel Lovati, that you used very well the example, he, and that's true that the Jacques tattoo changed a lot, and Laura and I, and we were talking that he whitened it in the second image. But we know that Motel Lovati continued using race as a marker. That was not the end. You know? mm -hmm. And he kind of, I really like the idea. I would like you, maybe you could talk a little more in the part that you couldn't talk because you stopped, about this new idea of a laboratory. Mm -hmm. What kind of laboratory we have now? I was wondering because it, I remember Nina Rodriguez saying at the last, at the end of the, the 19th century, that if Brazil was not an old country to be recognized like an old country, if, if Brazil was not a rich country to be recognized as a rich country, Brazil must be different. <laughs> and we were different because of our race. When you, you talk about Suarez Kurtz, is he trying to work with this paradox between universal and particular? And do we have something particular in this universal in environment? Or do, does he have to translate? There is something to translate, or the new laboratory is just universal now? Thank you so much. Pedro, and then Eddie. OK, it's very quick. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's a question for Marcia. I, I really enjoyed the panel you just gave us at the turn of the century, the first decades of the uh, first half of the 20th century in terms of health in the city. But I, I have a question of le about leisure. I mean, what role does leisure play within this whole uh, scenario, this whole uh, panel? Because on the one hand, you have leisure clearly being associated with the owners. I mean, this is what the Lobato uh, model, so to speak. But you have all the discussion around the modernistas, I mean, the leisure is sort of a, leisure is a sort of a form of resistance to uh, the lethal power of uh, <coughs> the advance of civilization. And leisure is, in this way, connected to the rights of the workers. So uh, it's, it's very uh, double, I don't know, it's very, very uh, disturbing, I think, the, 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 the role of leisure. So I just would like to hear about that. I, I think, uh, Eddie? Uh, one more, or okay. and then okay. and can I really enjoyed the panel, but my question is for, for Ricardo. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what kind of resonance do these, does this, um, does this ethnicizing pharmacogenomics have? I mean, I'm thinking of, of the ethnic drugs, uh, Vidal, and there's several others that have come about. And I'm thinking of, I mean, I can see the pushback from some of the academics. But what about the population in general? I mean, I can see American pharmaceutical companies saying, wow, what a great market, Brazil, look at all those, look at all those ethnic people. Uh, so, so uh, and, and then I saw a certain kind of a, when I, when, when I was at Ford Foundation, we were funding black women, so people started to do health stuff. And there was this very much this essentializing, like Vlad said, it's genetic makeup of my skin. You know, so I would think they would, they would, they would welcome that. But that might have, might have changed with all the evidence now. So I'm wondering, on the ground, how are people reacting? So John, and then uh, please make this. So sure. my question is actually connected to, to Andy's question, that is thinking about um, the politics of knowledge. You, know, you made a very, uh, you probably made a very important point at the end about getting published. So the, the question is the structure of funding internationally, and then peer review, because you know scientific claims circulate not just nationally but internationally. And how does that, what kind of pressure is that placement on these kinds of criteria that are important? Okay, so um, sort of this issue of the other side, it's, it's interesting that you raise the sort of this dual thing from Montero Lobato. Um, and it's not only him. If you take one of the main leaders of the sanitation campaign, Belisario Pena, um, he was also part of, a, um, I forgot exactly the name of the group. I have this written somewhere. But it, it was a group created in Brazil around the same time to talk about eugenics. And he was 
one of the main people there. And he's also the person leading the sanitation campaign. It was slightly different from what was being discussed in the US at the time. It was more about who should marry with who and should have, should, who should have kids with who, and all these ideas of having several medical exams before anybody could get married with anybody else. Um, but he was the key person. And I, I mean, I have to say, when I read this, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's crazy. This guy was traveling all over the rural areas, setting up posts of rural prophylaxis across the country. And at the same time, he's part of this group discussing, oh, maybe those people shouldn't marry and reproduce and, and have kids. So it was all right there. Um, uh, the issue of Getul is really interesting because you know, if you take all the labor rights and he created several things. If it was right or wrong, that's a whole different discussion, but he did it. Um, I think there, there's, I um, forgot what was the, the place where I read this, but there's all this discussion. There was no uh, document for, for the laborers. There was no, no single statistics about how many people you had working or, you know, that goes back to the issue of rights. Um, so the story is much more complicated than what I showed. And uh, there are several different caveats, including those people that were, in theory, after the 1916, trying to promote the right thing. So I fully agree with you. Um, the role of leisure um, probably can give you a very nice answer the way you expected. I said I'm not a historian. But there are a few things that I can talk about. Uh, one is the cortisos, which are the places I, I mentioned here, they were, from a political perspective, they also played an important role because they were the headquarters of resistance. Uh, you had freed slaves living there. And that's where a lot of the discussions and movements and protests trying to claim for abolition happened. So, so you have this issue of those places that are not clean, they're the full side of the disease, but there's also a political component. Those people are creating trouble. So, and, and with all that they would do there. And if you think about the freed slaves living there, there were certain um, you know, gatherings that goes back to the African culture that they were not very welcomed, but they were happening there. Um, and I think that's a, as much as I can say. Sorry, but I think it's a good point. Well, and thank you so much for the, the very nice and um, challenging comments um, I could try to address uh, as much as, as I can. Um, well, maybe I could start with, um, with the new idea of a laboratory. Right? I think that, as I have mentioned, I think this, uh, this perspective resonates uh, very long-standing ideas about Brazil as, as, as a laboratory. And in, in the, in, so in a way, uh, what Swaiskowitz and other people, I mean, the, the pharmacologists, they're saying is that there is a specificity here. So they're talking about specificity. They're talking about uh, difference. Uh, but the thing that they're talking about, the development of technology, right? They're talking about development of technology. So in a way, uh, one of the things that I showed, you're certainly not going to remember, is, is uh, how Swaiskowitz, his perspective, he's trying to broaden that and bring uh, Brazil as an example of an admixed population that should be studied uh, in terms of pharmacogenomics, also trying to bring data from India, from other places. So that's kind of a, there is this south to south perspective about uniting or bringing together that mixed population in terms of kind of fighting a, a, a technology, fighting a model that's from is from the north, so that's uh, so in a way. The, 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 I mean, we can go back to the UNESCO studies, of course, in the post Second World War. Yeah. That this idea, this idea about specificity and how you can inform the world on a very on a much broader scale about uh, specific things, and in this case, very much related to, to, to genomics and technology and healthcare. So I think that's, it really resonates with very long-standing ideas, and I think uh, I, do, I do not develop that in, 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 in this paper. I mean, as part of this, this, this project um, on the history of, of, of human genetics in Brazil, the Second World War, this is one of the perspectives. 
as it was continued to be treated as uh, as a racial laboratory. Whatever I mean, whatever the geneticists meant by race. But that's I mean that's their perspective, and and that's how actually they would link some of the books, as I, as I have mentioned. Um, so Edward Thames asked about uh, how people are reacting uh, on the ground. I mean, the politics of knowledge production. And I mean, this is very, it's very much related to several of the issues that uh, Maria Fernanda uh, mentioned in, in her comments. So some of the argument that uh, Swiss School is making here is not very different from the argument that Sash Bennett made at the Brazilian Supreme Court when he was fighting the quota the, the quota politics. It's very, very similar arguments that uh, from a genetic perspective, you cannot classify people who are black, white, etc. You have a continuum. So that's a very, very, very similar argument that inspiring both both perspectives, right? Uh, so as Maria Fernanda has mentioned, I mean, in, in going back to this idea of the individual, the collective, the, the clinic, I mean, the control, I mean, this, this is managing that's managing populations in a way. That's what this, 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 the scientists are talking here. I mean, how, how, uh, how to <coughs> adapt this technology uh, to the Brazilian context. So in a way, uh, we, we could kind of reflect a little bit about uh, the boundaries of genomic explanation in terms of social life. So certainly, this very same argument was placed in, in the debates about education. And here we are talking about, in a way, about the use of this knowledge in biomedicine and at a very high, uh, complex level of healthcare. But at the same time, what I, I mean, my perception of what's going on in Brazil, uh, if we look back, what's going on in terms of the politics of sexual anemia, for example, as Kipolu I mean, talked a lot of, to us yesterday, uh, the, the, the scientists back in the 1990s, uh, they had a position about universalizing uh, the fecal cell uh, test for the whole population and not placing that specifically uh, along some specific rate for some specific color race group. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, there is this debate, uh, this, this very, I mean, that's the same issue actually, in terms of how uh, you place uh, race, the, the race, color, discrimination in terms of the health care, access to health care, which certainly is not related to biological things, but how uh, visibility and visibility, they reflect upon how people get to the health care system and how they are treated. So at, in this arena here, we're talking about uh, the, the mention of the individual in terms of how, how you, you develop technologies to identify those which need or need not certain uh, dose of this drug, uh, how to define that, and at the same time we're talking about uh, genetics in a way related to healthcare on a much broader scale. So I mean, my my, my perception is that I mean th this is the kind of uh, the debate that has been going on for a long time. So I think at this point. Uh, I think the social movements, I mean, very clearly place, you know, the, the, the health, uh, the health-related politics in terms of healthcare adaptation and not paying, is emphasizing so much uh, those issues that relate to specific diseases. Uh, at the same time, and I, I had the opportunity to see a recent, uh, there was a recent conference in Salvador about sickle cell anemia where uh, the cover of the, 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 the poster was very much centered on an image of a black woman. So this, this debate about universalization and sickle cell testing and the sort of technology, I mean, that's really going on in Brazil. And uh, I think pharmacogenomics is a good example of what's going on. Uh, so I mean, the, 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 uh, the social movements has really been uh, Trying to fight some of these arguments, there is a, a scholar uh, called Michael Kent that's going to publish very soon a very interesting paper in Social Studies of Science about how uh, the social movements have been reacting to this genetic knowledge. Right. So this is this is something that 
is, is beginning to be studied and which is really very, very interesting in terms of going into details uh, uh, this kind of conversation, how, how, we can, how it can take place. In terms of uh, Br Brazilian samples, which is really a very interesting issue, I mean, how these Brazilian samples, they participate in this international network of science. And I, have, I mean, we have that in the paper in terms of these multicentric studies uh, aimed at getting samples from all over the world for uh, defining a new uh, algorithm for warfarin dosing using uh, samples from all over the world. And so, so uh, Scott was telling me that he sent maybe 500 samples for, for this multicentric study, but only, I don't remember the names, that we, uh, the numbers that we have, but just 50 got uh, included in the sample because most of the samples were from Pahus and they did not take the PAHU samples in these multicentric huh. studies because they just couldn't define what PAHU is. So it's interesting that just those classified, those classified as white and black were incorporated in, in a way in these multicentric studies. And I asked him about how do you see that in participating in a study like that at the same time while emphasizing specificity. And he said, well, that's the way science works on the international arena. <laughs> we have to publish. So, <laughs> So it's a very uh, it's a very complex dimension about uh, how he how, how the Brazilian team uh, when it's not participating in this international network at the same time when it's participating in the international network how how this sample are selected which samples are selected and the kind of argument that's made based on this sample. Yeah, question. Thanks so much for the you know for for one of presentations and I. I, I I think I wanted to follow up on uh, with Marcia and fast forward. You know, you have this, this wonderful picture where the externality is actually part of the system, which is great. You know, so so what's supposed to be the, the externality has actually been built into the system itself, which is fantastic. And I think what you said about uh, the restoring a sense of history to public health. So like fast forwarding now, because we know that you have done studies and you ended your presentation on, on the, the new bodies. You know, now the poor are the middle class. Right, so Brazil has very few poor people, right? According to the latest statistics or or imaginations of the government, you know, by and large, it's a middle class country, you know. And then it's a different body too, right? It's a different body. But also, so, so if you could tell us a little bit fast forwarding, you know, the question of regional differences because that was so important in bringing about public health in Brazil. So how regionally you see variations? In, uh, in this morbidity, mortality, and the non-communicable, you know, and uh, we, we, I know that you have done some work there. It would be helpful for us to think where, how this is playing out regionally in Brazil. Yeah, yeah so I, I don't really agree that Brazil doesn't have a poor population. They do, uh, but the thing is, when you look at an average for the country, it looks very good. Any kind no, no, of- I, I'm not seeing that, you know, no, I'm no, seeing the no, graphic no. of the I government. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the regional differences are still there. So if you take one indicator, for example, that I, I did a lot of work with, infant mortality, which is a proxy for living conditions and so on. Um, infant mortality has declined across the board pretty much everywhere in Brazil. But when you look at the inequality in deaths, in infant deaths, it's, it's still the, the poor that is disproportionately experienced more deaths among the infants. Um, so everybody's getting better, but not necessarily those that were in a much worse condition to start with were the ones gaining more. Interesting enough, if you look historically, so you take since 1980, for example, um, until 95 were actually the ones that were better off, that were reducing infant mortality even more. But then in 2000, you sort of have a shift in sort of regional changes in indicators in Brazil, which was very important, is were really the worst off. So the the communities in the northeast and the northern region that were actually reducing infant mortality more. And probably one of the reasons connected to that is that some of the interventions that could help reduce infant mortality and child mortality started to be targeted. So not everybody has access to it. So you have the cash transfers, you have the uh, family health program, so you have lots of interventions happening that only them can have access to. So they have an opportunity 
to take advantage of those interventions that the rest of the population cannot. Um, that's just one indicator. When you look at obesity and overweight that I showed in NCDs, uh, there is a, a book from Josué de Castro, uh, A Geography of the Form, The Geography of Hunger in Brazil, which to me is a classic. And, and somebody has to write a revised uh, edition, which now is going to be the geography of unbalanced nutrition. Because now you can have two maps where you still have poor nutrition and where you have the, uh, um, the overnutrition. And the thing is, they overlap. You have both everywhere. So I do a lot of work in the Amazon. You go to the Amazon, you still have obese and, and not obese, but overweight. And one of the reasons is that the nutritional uh, uh, composition is changing. So people have fruit trees in their backyards and they got rotten and they're buying the powder to make fruit juice for the kids. And I said it's a ticking bomb because it's increasing very fast among kids and adolescents as well. So, um, you know, moving forward, it, it's in some way we still have the inequalities that started way back in the past being perpetuated, and some of them getting bigger. bigger. Um, and it's not with millennium development goals that look at one number for the country that we're going to solve that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.